Hello everyone, my name is Sunshine Menezes. I am Executive Director of Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Metcalf Institute webinar as part of our Climate Change and the News series. This series intends um, to look at issues of climate change science, um, how we are adapting to, or planning for, responding to climate change, um, what are some of the ways that we can communicate effectively and ineffectively about climate change. Um, we're looking just at a really wide range of topics related to climate change and how it affects our daily lives. So today, we're really pleased to have a conversation about America's aging infrastructure in the face of climate change, featuring Dr. Janie Camp of Vanderbilt University. Dr. Camp is part of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Program, or department there. She uses tools such as GIS mapping to address our challenges related to infrastructure and transform the results and um, into information and tools that can help inform the public and decision makers. The projects that she's really been um, heavily involved in focus on investigating the risks and impacts of natural hazards on transportation and water infrastructure systems, which she'll tell us more about today. Um, and she has received a number of awards for her work, um, several from the American Society of Civil Engineers in 2011 as the Tennessee Section Young Engineer of the Year Award, and in 2012 as uh, the Citizen Engineer Awardee. She is also past president of the Tennessee Society of Professional Engineers and has served on the American Society of Civil Engineers National Committee on America's Infrastructure and assisted with both the 2013 and 2017 infrastructure report cards. It's my pleasure to now welcome Dr. Janie Camp. Dr. Camp. Janie. All right. All right. Are we good? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. OK, thank you so much for having me um, this afternoon. Um, and. As Sunshine said, okay. um, thank you so much for having me this afternoon. Um, I'm happy to come talk to this group via webinar about uh, America's aging infrastructure and um, climate change and extreme weather impacts to infrastructure systems. Um, so as it was noted, I've done a lot of work looking at infrastructure systems, and we're trying to help inform decisions on management of infrastructure under a changing climate. So, oh. um, we have infrastructure, and it's any type of infrastructure. We're not just talking about transportation, although the bulk of my work looking at infrastructure and climate change has been in the transportation sector, but um, we're working on projects looking at water, inland waterway navigation infrastructure and things like that. But it affects all of the infrastructure that we rely on on a daily basis. Um, we're starting to see more extreme weather, like short duration, intense storm events. We're seeing that in Nashville. We're seeing it in other areas of the country. We're seeing more extreme hurricanes and more heat waves and droughts and extreme colds. Um, not too long ago, Atlanta had snow, and they weren't really prepared to deal with that. So we're seeing some extremes in areas that we haven't seen before. But what does this mean? Well, it means additional costs for operations and maintenance and repairs and recovery. And ultimately, our goal is to help inform decisions so that maybe instead of having to, you know, invest retroactively to repair infrastructure, if we can make investments on the front end to um, create infrastructure that is adaptable or able to withstand um, these extreme events then maybe we won't have to pay for it in the aftermath. And we hopefully won't see as many disruptions to our daily lives um, as we move forward. So let's talk about infrastructure for a minute. We use infrastructure every day. And I really like the um, graphic that is on the right of the screen 
produced by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, how much infrastructure do you use before noon? A lot of us think about the roadways. We see potholes, we see bridges, uh, we see pavement that may be rutting. And those are, you know, things that are kind of at the forefront. But in the aftermath of Flint, Michigan and other issues related to water infrastructure, that's raised some attention. But a lot of times the infrastructure we use, we don't even think about. And often it's out of sight, out of mind. We've grown accustomed to using infrastructure that was put in many years ago, and we're essentially borrowing things that previous generations invested in. The infrastructure that we're using is retar reaching retirement age for the bulk of it. And we need to start thinking about how do we utilize this? How do we ensure that it lasts for more generations? Not just new infrastructure that we're building, but also infrastructure that already exists, that we're repairing post event um, when we do have disruptive events and things like that. The American Society of Civil Engineers does an infrastructure report card every four years. And the most recent one came out in spring of 2017 for America's infrastructure received a grade of a D plus. Um, I have children and in my book, a D is not great. And I think if you talk to any engineer, they would agree, we've got to do better. And it's not that our infrastructure is failing, it's just we're lacking in capacity, funding, and in, you know policies to help manage that. There's been, um, some increases in grades um, from the 2013 report card to the 2017 report card. But overall, the grades aren't good. There's not a single category of the 16 categories that has above a B. And we can improve that, especially looking to the future when we take into consideration that climate change is just going to add additional wear and tear to this infrastructure that we depend on. So I know a lot of people are concerned about climate change and in some areas it's not a nice word or term to use. But a few years ago a term came out after global warming called climate wording that I really like because instead of global warming many people think that everything's going to get warmer and that's not really the case necessarily, or you're not going to experience that at the local level with the way global warming works and how our climate behaves because of various zones and um, flow paths of climate weather systems and things like that. So I really like this um, graphic that shows the differences. Some areas will actually experience colder winters, more precipitation, some will experience drought. It doesn't mean that everything locally is just going to be warmer. We're going to see weirder things and more extremes happen over time. So I personally believe that we're already seeing the impacts of climate change. I know some people have debated this. You know, can we really link some of the extreme weather that's happened to overall global climate change? And I think we can. And here are some examples of local issues that have arose in the past few years where we're having to deal with these climate extremes at the local level. Houston, Hurricane Harvey, Nashville, where I'm at, we had a major flood in 2010. We had a lot of rain come from Harvey. Um, Phoenix, airplanes couldn't get off the ground last year because of the heat and the requirements of their engines to get lift. Um, Miami Beach is actually um, looking at raising infrastructure and dealing with flooding and sea level rise. Los Angeles is having uh, more like heat waves that are affecting local citizens. So there's lots of things happening if you just look at the news. Here's more news clips, um, drought contributing to more wildfires, um, droughts in the upper Midwest. In 2012, we had droughts 
after a major flooding event in 2011 in the Midwest um, Ohio Mississippi Valley region. So we're going from one extreme to the next. So this is adding up, not just in recovery and response, but in making decisions for infrastructure that's going at new infrastructure to deal with some of these issues. So here's one example that I like to look at. There's, um, I have a colleague here who has a wealth of experience in the marine industry. And we had Katrina in 2010, the Cheatham Lock was underwater, um, the photo on the left. And then in St. Louis, because of freezing, barges couldn't get through. Um, so flooding and freezing and drought uh, are all contributing to just movement of freight on the inland waterway system, but they can have impacts to other infrastructure systems as well. Those are just a few examples. I also wanted to note and bring out the point that there's, these impacts are not isolated. So a drought happening in the Midwest doesn't just affect the Midwest, it affects the rest of the country, whether or not we like it and accept it. Flooding and drought can affect agriculture, so what product is available to move to market, but also getting it to market. So during the drought in 2012, barges were stuck essentially because they couldn't get through. You, can, you need enough water to float the barges to move agricultural products and other things down our inland waterway system. There's also impacts of flooding can wipe out rail lines that are moving crude oil to the Gulf from the Bakken and Canada and other places to the refineries that are stationed in the Gulf. But that may affect, you know, fuel in your area. It can also um, affect other commerce getting where it needs to be. Energy power lines and the distribution system, we're, you know, as much as we can as engineers and planners, we try to build in redundancies, but in some cases it's just not feasible. But we don't necessarily always think about how energy may be related to whether or not you can have clean water. We transport some chemicals by rail to um, treat as far as the um, water treatment process. And then um, those plants also need energy for the pumps. So all of these things can be interrelated. There can be cascading effects from an event happening in one region that you see the impacts in other regions with cost of products going up or an inability to um, actually even receive products. An example of how you can have cascading effects that you don't even realize and how infrastructure systems are not limited to the local system. Um, we did a study here at Vanderbilt funded by the National Waterways Foundation and the U.S. Maritime Administration to look at the impacts of unscheduled lock outages on the inland waterway system. We looked at four locks. This is just a graphic uh, representing some of the findings associated with Markman Lock and Dam. And you would not typically expect that one lock being out um, and barge traffic not being able to move through that would have an effect on much of the central and part of the eastern U.S. And we saw that with almost every lock we looked at was, you know, 80 plus counties having commerce and jobs affected because of one single lock being out. So what can we do? I think knowledge can help in a lot of ways. So I'm I'm a data scientist. I focus a lot on data and information and how do we get that information in the hands of the decision makers in an appropriate format for them to use it to make informed decisions. And there are lots of different adaptation strategies to address climate change impacts to infrastructure systems and communities. Some that's already taking place is looking at raising infrastructure and this is happening in a lot of coastal areas. It's also happening in inland areas where flooding has become uh, 
not necessarily a nuisance, but a real problem. Um, so you can raise infrastructure to reduce damages and protect it, but that requires investment and sometimes some redesign. We can also look at new infrastructure and trying to um, raise that as we're building to plan for the future. We shouldn't be designing and building infrastructure assuming that everything's going to be as it has been for the past decade or more. We can work to create additional flood protection through buffers and natural resources, um, creating, you know, more green space to absorb these intense flood, um, intense precipitation events that lead to flash flooding and um, things like that. Uh, we may even need to start looking at changing how we do insurance moving forward and hardening of a structure. But I think the first step is really to identify and protect vulnerable populations and critical assets. And this is where the GIS work that we do comes in. There's national level efforts to build resilience. And so depending on who you speak with, they may have different definitions for resilience. But I think resilience is an ability to um, withstand an event and bounce back quickly, possibly better than you were, but not necessarily. So the US um, Department of Transportation, Federal Highway Administration has done some climate change resiliency pilots. And you can see a map of where those have been done on the screen. And HUD um, has also done a national disaster resilience competition, an effort to provide funding to start looking at building resilience in communities where disaster has already happened. There are tools that are available to help do this. So community managers, planners, engineers, or even citizens that are interested in getting involved and helping out can start utilizing these tools that are publicly available and free. Um, I will say with a caveat, like FEMA's has this um, does require some GIS knowledge and an ArcGIS license from ESRI. But for the most part, these are free and publicly available to help you in defining what the risks are to infrastructure, identify vulnerable infrastructure systems, and walk through processes such as the steps to resilience um, on the screen from the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. And NOAA's Digital Coast provides an interesting approach to visualizing how sea level rise may look and impact infrastructure in coastal areas. One thing that we utilize a lot that is also publicly available is um, downscaled global climate data. So the downscaled climate data um, allows you to look at temperature and precipitation at a um, fairly localized level and you can grab input information and grab um, grid cells that have projections for both mid-century and century um, estimates for these parameters, these weather characteristics um, in the future, which can be used for planning. Um, these are based on the global climate models and multiple model pairs looking at different scenarios for the future. Um, an example of how you can do this is um, two projects I've been involved in focused on transportation. One was a project um, for the Tennessee Department of Transportation. This was part of their pilot study from Federal Highways to look at climate change. And we can look at, you know, at very localized county level, even beyond, um, what the probability of exceeding certain precipitation would be, what the changes in precipitation may be in the future, or heat, and identify local transportation assets in that region that we can do a drill down and identify, you know, what the potential impacts of that could be and do additional engineering analysis as to what adaptation strategies are viable and how much they would cost and things like that. Um, you can do higher level, national level screening analysis using climate data as well to identify hot spots or regions where precipitation or temperature may 
impact um, infrastructure systems. This is looking at freight systems, hot spots, um, looking at precipitation in the future. But ultimately, I think um, it's one thing to have information and tools to generate, you know, knowledgeable information to inform decisions. But I think we need to have more of a holistic approach as well. So communities can work together to cre create resilience. Um, something we saw in 2010 in Nashville was that um, the community really came together and responded well. And that's something we need to be prepared for as um, individuals is knowing how we can contribute to response and recovery efforts locally so that the impacts are not as bad, especially for those socially um, vulnerable populations. There's also an opportunity for sectors to work together. As I said, the impacts are not localized necessarily. There are um, trickle-down effects and connections that need to be considered. So working together to plan across sectors can be beneficial. An example is the um, waterway action plans that are in place for many of the inland waterway systems where the operators come together and identify under extreme conditions, high and low flow, how they're going to set the rules for the waterway to ensure that freight can still move through, but that safety is ultimately preserved. And these things can be modeled to help inform decision making. Um, we can also work to help educate everyone in our community about the potential risk and hazards associated with climate change and extreme weather and how to be prepared. So taking the information and transforming that into educational tools um, and information is critical. I think as much as we try to plan and design as engineers and community planners, um, planning for the future, we can't necessarily prepare for everything. Um, but there are things and creative approaches that can be used. And I think we need to not totally say we're just going to always build bigger and stronger. I think we need to be open to things like graceful failure. So in Cairo, um, Illinois, back in 2011, the Corps of Engineers actually broke the levy and um, opened the Birds Point floodway as a way to reduce flood impacts downstream. So being creative and thinking about alternative ways to reduce impacts to infrastructure systems moving forward is something worthwhile. Also think, you know, if an area is prone to disaster, there is a strong chance that, you know, it's just going to continue. And maybe we need to reconsider, do we rebuild and if so, to what standards? Or do we look at alternatives? Do we consider relocation? So I think we have to be open-minded in our approach to ensure that we protect the people because they are our most valuable assets. And with that, I will, would like to leave you with this quote um, that a colleague, uh, Julie Shortridge at Virginia Tech, summarized. But I think it captures a lot of what we're trying to do and um, looking to the future. We ultimately want to protect the people and their infrastructure that serves the people moving forward. With that, I will turn it back over and take questions. All right, so we'd like to um, ask a few questions now. Thank you very much, Dr. Camp, for that great presentation. Um, I, I'll remind everybody that you can submit questions either via the, the chat function um, uh, on the webinar service or you can um, send in questions via Twitter using the hashtag MetcathCC as in climate change. So the first question we have today is um, regarding the infrastructure report cards specifically and it appears that some of the grades have actually gone up. So what caused that? Yes, so um, those are our success stories, I guess. Um, so a part of the consideration is investment and capacity 
innovation um, and you know planning for the future. So when funding has been allocated in an area, the grade can go up. If there's funding, you know, federal funding allocated or authorized and actually put into place to improve things. A good case in point is um, FAST Act and funding related to U.S. Department of Transportation infrastructure investment. Um, rail has gone up because of private investment. Our rail infrastructure is privately managed and the rail companies are actually looking to the future planning and investing to protect and improve that system. So we can learn lessons on the public side from those private investments and the benefits seen from those. Great, thank you. You also mentioned several publicly available tools for adaptation planning and building resilience. But are these tools that anyone can use? Do you need to have special expertise? Do you need to have special equipment? Um, are, are they really available for community use? They're fairly easily accessible and easy to use. Most of them have guidelines available and instructions. I've had undergraduate students, um, even since they're not engineering students, tap into these resources and use them on projects to look at infrastructure and community resilience. Um, so I think the general public if they are aware that they exist, can absolutely get in there and start using those tools to know more about what's going on and how they can make informed decisions, even about their own property. And finally, um, another question is, you presented examples to us from the transportation sector, but what about the water sector? Yes, so um, on the water side, what I saw a great presentation not long ago about considering investment in gray or purple pipes. So thinking about water reuse and do we really need to treat the water to, you know, the highest standards at the plant? Or maybe we've seen, you know, there's a lot of leaks in the national water distribution side um, in the pipelines over years just because of aging infrastructure. And perhaps we need to start thinking about treating more on site or closer to um, the consumer and the client as opposed to treating everything at the plant and losing millions of gallons of water. So those are things that are being considered. A lot of um, places are starting to put um, liners in their pipes to help reduce the um, leakages and ensure that all of the water being treated at the plant is, as much as possible is actually making it to the customer. And those are some innovative ways to try to address some of the infrastructure aging issues um, and also create some system resilience. So what would it cost you know, ballpark um, if we really were to tackle these infrastructure problems nationally? Billions, unfortunately. But if you start looking at, you know, federal budgets, a few billion doesn't really make a big difference in the, you know, large federal budget. And in all honesty, there's some great studies that um, ASE commissioned an economic firm to do a few years ago. And it was, um, they were economic studies about the cost to individual home for investment. And we're looking at, at the individual basis, a few hundred dollars a year could make a wealth of difference in the broader system. In your local community, um, infrastructure. So, you know, a little bit added to the gas tax to fund highway investment or additional, you know, a few cents more in your actual water fees to help with the infrastructure at the local level, which helps the overall grade nationally. Um, I don't think we'd miss it. A lot of people equate the personal investment being, you know, a cup of coffee a day, if we could give that up, then we would see great changes in our infrastructure 
and how it performs. A couple more questions. You also mentioned something about increasing um, or, or changing the, the way that insurance covers these various challenges that we face. I know this is not your area of expertise, but is there anything in your opinion that you would like to share in terms of what you think those changes might be? A lot of the insurance, we pay premiums um, for insurance, but it's kind of our last resort to, you know, that's our backup plan for if anything happens. And there's the National Flood Insurance Program that's being kind of reconsidered and there's work happening related to that. But I think moving forward, a lot of people, especially in the flood area, people are required to have flood insurance if they're in certain zones related to 100-year flood events. But we're starting to see those events happen more frequently. So perhaps we need to be looking more at, you know, encouraging citizens to go beyond and gain coverage above and beyond what is required. Um, so that they're prepared and have that safety net when, you know, you do get the 500-year flood event. And I think there are things that, uh, similar to that, related to other natural hazards that we could consider. Um, I know a lot of the insurance is privately managed, and so individually, we need to think about protecting ourselves. but. We also need our communities to help educate and policymakers to acknowledge that more needs to be done. Okay, um, I have one more question for you, um, and that is very um, Metcalf Institute specific because, of course, we're interested in um, communication of science and environmental topics. And you mentioned that um, you like to use the term climate weirding. So I wonder. Um, in your experience working especially with other engineers and with um, municipal officials, if you have found that that language is especially um, helpful or if, um, you know, there are other ways of talking about these climate change challenges that have been very effective. Yeah, so um, at least on some of our projects, the more acceptable term, right? in place of climate change has been extreme weather and talking about extreme weather. And I think the hard part with discussing climate change with anyone, even myself as an engineer, talking about probability of occurrence of, you know, and what two degrees Celsius really means on a global scale and how that might be felt locally, those are hard concepts to grasp. Um, and the timelines of talking about mid-century and in 2100 what, you know, our world might look like in terms of climate. I think those are just really almost abstract concepts that are hard to grasp. But if I, when I talk to community members, um, I like to talk to them about, you know, we've seen a lot more intense flooding. Have you noticed some of these precipitation events and, you know, how you're Also, think discussing, you know, I want to think about what the world will be like for my children and my grandchildren and help them prepare for the future. So if we think about it not so much as mid-century and 2100, but generationally, I think that's a way to communicate because you love your kids, if you have kids and or you have family that are younger, thinking about what the next generation is going to have to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, I think can help and painting a picture in terms of scenarios and what we've seen recently can help with that. Okay, thank you so much Dr. Camp, it was really a pleasure to have you and thanks to all of you for joining us today. I hope you will come visit us another time when we have a future webinar and um, you can see this, this video on our Metcalf YouTube channel or on our website. Um, when you visit our YouTube channel, which is just search for Metcalf Institute, you'll find hundreds of videos um, featuring all kinds of science and environmental topics and um, people from all over the nation talking about these issues. We'd love to hear your feedback. 
Um, also note that at the very end of this presentation, there's a link to a survey. You can take that survey to let us know any, um, any topics that you would like to hear about so that we can plan for them in the future. Thank you. Hi.